God be merciful to me. God be merciful to me, on thy grace I rest my plea. Plenteous in compassion thou, blot out my transgressions now. Wash me, make me pure within, cleanse, oh cleanse me from my sin. My transgressions I confess, grief and guilt my soul oppress. I have sinned against thy grace, and provoked thee to thy face. I confess thy judgment just, speechless I thy mercy trust. I am evil born in sin, thou desirest truth within. Thou alone my Savior art, teach my wisdom to my heart. Make me pure, thy grace bestow, wash me whiter than the snow. Broken, humbled to the dust, by thy wrath and judgment just, let my contrite heart rejoice, and in gladness hear thy voice. From my sins, O oh, hide thy face, blot them out in boundless grace. Gracious God, my heart renew, make my spirit right and true. Cast me not away from thee, let thy spirit dwell in me. Thy salvation's joy impart, steadfast make my willing heart. Sinners then shall turn from me, and return, O oh God, to thee. Savior, all my guilt remove, and my tongue shall sing thy love. Touch my lips, O Lord, lips, O Lord, and my mouth shall praise accord. Well, hear God's word as we look at it together. We're looking at a very well-known chapter, probably one of the best-known chapters in all the scripture, at least one of them. And we're looking at two of the parables out of three here this week. And we'll have a baptism next week, so we'll kind of jump from, from Luke again back. And, uh, but we'll go back to Genesis next week uh, because of the baptism. And we're looking at Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. And it says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of, God, of the angels of God over one sinner, who repents. Oh, brothers and sisters in Christ, you can open up the pages of Scripture and we see reminders and promises describing the redeeming love of God. In such a place as Psalm 145, where it says, The Lord is gracious, slow to anger, and great 
and mercy. He's full of compassion too. Do we humbly grasp this promise? That that's a promise for you and I, even as we struggle with our sins, and our doubts and our fears. But it's also a promise, not even for just for us as sinners, but everyone that the Lord will call to Him in repentance. But here's the more amazing thing. Do you realize that God, or that you are here, and that others will be brought because God unstoppingly pursues those that He has set His grace on to save, that He has chosen to save. And the parables here show this joyful pursuit of God's lost and found. To encourage us even about God's mercy to us, but even for many others. Now we can relate to what this parable is talking, these parables are talking about, about losing and finding things. Each one of us has lost something. It may be like uh, a keys or like Marie and I were walking around uh, 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 Chaska, the, the lake there, and, and one little kid was kind of looking around for something, and, and I said, can I help you? And he goes, yeah, I lost my Rolex. Of course, there were some thoughts that came to my mind, and I thought, a 14-year-old wearing a Rolex. <laughs> He had lost it. He was panicking. We've lost all sorts of things, and it's probably maybe occurrence, maybe for some, even this past week. We've lost small things. We've lost big things. Some of the most important things are our children. And sometimes maybe we lost them for a time. At the Minnesota Zoo, when Joe was very little, he was crawling around some caves and, and near the bear exhibit. And all of a sudden, we couldn't find him. Marie backtracked to the entrance. Zach and I ran further on into the park and split up, looking di different directions. Abby, Ellie, and Anna searched in between. There was extreme panic as, as every nightmare possibility ran through our heads. But that fear was overtaken by joy and relief when he was found back at the bear exhibit. See, Jesus uses these parables about the lost sheep and lost coin and, and eventually the lost boy. Not just because we can, we can associate with that, but it's to humble us and teach us something about the very character of our triune God. See, God is correcting our sinful tendencies to think of Him like we do maybe a judge or even think of him like we think of as a policeman. Now again, there's some bad negative ideas about police. And we've got to remember the police are the first to rush in when we call them. But we tend to panic when we're driving down the road and have a policeman behind us because we, we kind of have this idea that he, he's just waiting for us to mess up and give us a ticket. Maybe it's because some like me have deserved it long before. But that's not how our triune God works, though. Which is why we're taught this morning in this parable here, or these parables, to first rejoice in God's great effort to seek and save the lost, and as well as we should, must rejoice in what heaven rejoices in, of sinners being brought to repentance. Remember here, as we come to chapter divisions and verses, they weren't originally in the text. And before today's passage, Jesus had just said, He who has an ear, let him hear. He was calling people really to listen to him. And now what do we read in the very first verse? All the tax collectors and sinners drew near to hear him. Now admittedly, we probably don't have an IRS agent living down the street from us. And some may not like IRS agents very much particularly when we have to pay taxes. But they don't compare with the tax collectors in the ancient day. Tax collectors were hated collaborators with the Romans. The people had to pay taxes to the tax person specifically just for being alive. They, had a, they also had a sales tax like we do, but they had a tax on produce, 
They had a tax on oil. They had a tax on wine. They had an income tax above that. They had a road tax if you wanted to drive down the road. They had a, car, a cart tax if you have a wagon or, or some sort of cart. You had a tax every time you brought your boat into port or even took it out from the dock. And these tax collectors were known to, to charge a little bit more to keep for themselves. They were so despised that the synagogues would not accept their tithes or offerings, and they couldn't testify in court. Now the sinners that were gathering around were those who committed scandalous and well-publicized sins. You know, the Pharisees were able to hide that from everybody else. Their own sins, at least. And the religious Pharisees and scribes thought that these people were, were appalling. And they complained, and, and even the word there in the Greek is used to kind of sound like a murmuring. But they complained, this man, and what they were thinking is, this, this teacher of the law, this, this holy man, we know as God the Son, they accused that as one who receives sinners and eats with them. They thought this was a reason to condemn Jesus, but it was a fulfillment of the very purpose for which the Lord Jesus came into the world for you and I. And this wasn't anything new. Jesus had already declared, I have not come to call the righteous, and really that's self-righteous, but sinners to repentance. And the last time we were in Luke, we even saw in chapter 14, Jesus had already declared that this was his intent to draw the poor, the maimed, lame, and blind to the heavenly banquet. So should it surprise us that his earthly ministry, that in his earthly ministry he sat down and drew these same type of people to himself? See, this is why the bro most broken soul, even this morning, even here, can find hope. Because it's the only hope that any of us have, that you and I have a Savior who receives sinners like me, like you. Well, by these two par parables that we're looking at today, we learn first we should, must rejoice in God's great effort to seek and save the lost. Verse 3 tells us, so he spoke this parable to them, and really using the lost sheep and the lost corn, he, he's using them as metaphors of the people that the Pharisees despised. Saying, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost and, and what it was eating, and, and gradually, one mouthful at a time, moves further and further away from the flock and further and further away from the shepherd. Its appetite draws it away into untold danger. Sin is kind of the same way, isn't it? Always starts small. Begins with a desire, a thought, and gradually starts changing the course of a life if it's not repented of and bit by bit a person is destroyed. James 1 reminds us this is how sin works. He says, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. The truth of Scripture tells us, because of sin, even sins which, we might, which would, you know, might be quite different from other people's sins, all of us really are still the same, aren't we? Yeah, Scripture says, all we like sheep have gone astray. And like straying sheep, we are helpless prey. By nature, we don't search out for God. Because Jesus even says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. The reason is our sinful hearts. And a sinful heart is a wandering heart. But as Paul wrote, too, there, there's another problem, too. Apart from God grabbing us and bringing us back, we are lost. Because as Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, here's the problem, whose, whose mind the gods of this age have blinded. Do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory, or lest they see, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ be seen. See, the point is, unbelievers are lost. We were lost until the Lord worked in our heart. 
And yet what happens here is Jesus talks about a shepherd who went out to seek the one lost sheep. And isn't that a picture of the good shepherd who came, as he said, to seek and save that which was lost? In fact, the shepherd does all the work. You notice that. He grabs the sheep. He doesn't lead them back. He sets them on his shoulder and carries them. And this rescue is no different than how God works in our life <clears throat> to work in us to will and to do his good pleasure. And Jesus doesn't just talk about a lost sheep. He talks about a lost coin as well. <clears throat> For the coin, it was, it was circumstances out of the coin's control that it was lost. And there's people too in our society, just the pressures of life and the struggles. And they quickly fall into sin. But here's this coin. It fell to the ground. It became unusable, tarnished and dirty. In verse 8 we read, What woman, having ten coins, silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? You know, before it was one sheep out of a hundred. Couldn't you imagine somebody saying, you know, do you really have to go find that? It's dark, it's night, there's a storm. Now you have one silver coin out of ten. Jesus is intensifying the value of the lost. His value of people like you and I. It's always interesting to me. And I think that's there's a reason Jesus speaks about the woman that's turning her house literally upside down looking for a coin. I don't know how many of you have, have had this happen, but uh, I'll ask my wife, you know, where, where is this thing again? And she goes, right over here. You know, it's, it's over on the shelf right in this place. And I go look, and I look. I seriously look. But I don't find it. But for some reason, it suddenly appears right before my wife gets there. Here's this woman. She turns on every light. She sweeps the house. She searches high and low to find it. The whole point is, is though, is to give a reflection of how God goes to great effort to seek and save the lost, to come to you and I where we are in our sin. Notice the value that God places not just on you and I, as he's made us his children, but those that are still lost, that he is determined to save. These religious Pharisees thought these tax collectors and sinners were beneath them and worse, beyond sovereign help and reformation of God. And let's be honest, even as Christians, as we struggle day by day with our sin, as we daily increase our sin and guilt, can't we feel that too, that maybe, maybe we're just beyond the reach of God, but that's why we're struggling? And yet nothing could be further from the truth. Because that's not what Jesus teaches. In fact, this is an object lesson to all who follow Christ even too, calling us to, to, to look at, at those around us, calling for us to care for the weaker members of God's flock or those that are straying even. That are lost. Because we have a God who in love predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself. He did that when we weren't worthy. He did that when we were lost. And he did that all according to the good pleasure of his will. And the reality is what happens by, by the illustration of the man going out to find that one sheep and leaving the 99 behind of that woman that, that, that goes and turns her house upside down Jesus is illustrating that our triune God will spare no expense to save sinners like me, sinners like you. He gave us his son. He's given us his word. Added on to that are, are the gifts that he has given uh, of the church and preachers so that you might believe 
and in that way be found and be restored to usefulness to the Lord, love and fellowship. But the question that looms too is not just a personal one about how you and I look at God's love and, and realize how He's pursued us. The question also is there, how will you and I reflect our good shepherd or the diligent woman searching after that lost coin? What will you and I do for the lost we know in our lives, for those straying from God? We have those in the church. Some of us have them in our families. Here's a God who spared no expense. Here he is, the author and the finisher of our faith, as the Bible tells us, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He left his throne in glory to become our righteousness and go to the cross to shed his blood for our sins, to take the curse that we deserve. And guess what? He didn't do that begrudgingly. He did that joyfully. And that really brings us to the second point. To rejoice in what heaven rejoices in when sinners are brought to repentance. The Jews of Jesus' day had a saying. You know, we've got a Bible verse as you come in. You know, I, I kind of wondered if maybe some of the synagogues might have had this, or at least it was a well-known saying. There's joy before God when those who provoke him perish from the world. It's not what we read in Ezekiel. It's not what we read here. Because look at what happens of what Jesus describes here for the sheep that is found. That one sheep. In verse 6, the shepherd calls his friends and his neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. And then look at the woman. And the lost coin, she says, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. And Jesus even expands on this to remind us that, that we live in a society, not just with that the horizontal plane of what we see here, but there's heaven and there's even hell. And we learn in verse 7, Jesus says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Understanding, each one of us needs repentance. Jesus is just turning the Pharisees' words back on themselves. They're thinking they're righteous because how they stay separate from others and, and, and stay at least away from outward sin. But Jesus is showing that the angels who know about damnation because a third rebelled and followed Lucifer, the angel of light, that angel of, that, that masquerades as an angel of light. These angels that understand that rebellion, they rejoice over God's redemption of a sinner. They rejoice over your repentance and mine. They don't rejoice over a church building or a self-righteous religious action, but they rejoice over God-given repentance, even as we must. You know, what would be our feeling? Of course, now we can't hardly see each other. We're looking through windshields at each other and windows and, and a few out here too. But what would be our feeling if, if somebody with tattoos all over the place and, and nose piercings and, and maybe in rags walked into the church? It's funny, my parents, years ago, they were at Calvin's church, and they didn't want to leave their camera in the car. They walked into the church, and the elder there said, no, no, you, you go over here. And so they thought dutifully, okay, there must be an English service there. Well, the elder pointed them to the American embassy, wouldn't let them come in the church. Would a sinner be welcomed with us? Their sins may be different, but they're sinners like us.
What is the repentance, too, that Jesus is talking about here? Do we know what that is? Is it just saying, I'm sorry? Well, God-given repentance drives a person to confess their specific sin against God. People are not, we're not going to confess our sins rightfully to each other. We'll always be short on that. But we need to confess them before God, clearly. And a repentance is, a repentant man or woman will say something like, I am a drunkard, rather than, well, you know, I, I'm an alcoholic, I have this problem. No, I'm, I have this sin. A sin, it, it's not a sickness. That's kind of the bad term of alcoholic. No, this is a sin. And, and you and I need to come before the Lord and we need to put our, our specific sin right not there. Not, not generally speaking about, well, you know, I... I'm just fallen. I, I have these struggles. But go through the Ten Commandments. Lord, I, I struggle with this. Putting you first as you deserve. Put your specific sin out there. For our problem before a holy God is not a sickness. It is a sin. And we need to confess the specifics of it to God. To admit to God, to the one who already knows everything, that this way your law says, but this is my sin. Forgive me. Help me to hate. Help me to turn from it always more and more. Because you and I have a Savior who came not to call the righteous or the self-righteous, but sinners to repentance. And this Savior hates pride and self-righteousness. While at the same time, he promises in Scripture to beautify the humble with salvation. And again, this is critical as we look at the world around us. Because the most important thing that you and I can seek in the world is the repentance of the lost. Put yourself around sinners in hope of, of making inroads with the gospel. Pray about that. Because Jesus did not come into the world to say, you're okay, I'm okay. He didn't come in the world to condone people's lifestyles, but to draw them and bring them to repentance. Repentance. That's why Jesus emphasized this fact again in verse 10. He says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Jesus is calling you and I to take delight, not in the things of this world, but in the repentance of sinners. And God rejoices in your and my repentance, he rejoices in other people's repentance too. In fact, there's an almost forgotten Bible book, Zephaniah. How many times do we read from Zephaniah? It looked forward to Jesus' redemption this way. It says, The Lord your God, in your midst, the Mighty One, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. It's a humbling thing to think Jesus would sing over me. But if it brings joy to the Lord, your and my repentance, shouldn't it do the same for us when others repent? Shouldn't we seek that which brings joy to our Savior? Brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus' point really is your Heavenly Father is more willing to forgive you and others as sinners deserving to be judged, to save his lost and found, then we are willing to repent, that we are willing to forgive somebody else. One of my favorite writers, J.C. Riles, or one of my favorite pastors, he puts it this way, Let the person who is afraid to repent consider well these verses, and be afraid no more. There is nothing on God's part to justify our fears. An open door is set before you. A free pardon awaits you if you confess your sins. God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The very change which sinners call foolish is a change which fills heaven with joy. Have you repented? That, after all, is a spiritual question which concerns us. What shall it profit us to know God's love if we do not use it? These parables that Jesus teaches us here 
Don't just show a general concern or a compassion for sinners in mass, but individual sinners. People like me, people like you. Think about what it says. The shepherd goes after one sheep. The woman hunts for one coin. Our Lord and Savior, the good shepherd, what does the scripture say? He knows us. He knows his sheep by name. He cares for you. And you and I must join with the tax collectors and the scandalous sinners to listen to him, to cast ourselves at him, even to sing as one part of the hymn Amazing Grace says, I once was lost, but now I'm found. And being found, we need to be consider, concerned for those yet that are lost too. Because we have a good and faithful shepherd who seeks and saves the lost. It's why we're here. Well, let's pray. Almighty God, the most gracious Heavenly Father, Encourage us this morning about your redeeming love through your Son, Jesus, by which you promise sinners like us that all that the Father gives you will come to you, and all who comes to me I will by no means cast out. We rejoice, Lord Jesus, that you are a Savior who receives sinners, and that's what gives us hope even now. And we're thankful that you pursue us. No matter where we've run to, you pursue us as, and you send even your hounds of heaven as the, as the one uh, poet writes about that, that, that rejected Christ and the things of the church and, and, and ran from you and yet you pursued him and hunted him down. He went to drugs and all sorts of things. And yet he had not run too far for you. We thank you that you reveal yourself to be like that shepherd leaving the flock to go after the one sheep or the woman who turns her house upside down. For one coin, thank you for your redeeming love by which you pursue us and many others. Make us, Lord, to repent of our own sourness, our own self-righteousness, our own pharisaical hearts too, and not rejoicing when other sinners repent. Make us to pray for those others that are straying from you in the church, perhaps even in our own, very fa our own families. Lord, make us reflect you, seeking them by all means. And then, Lord, help us to seek what brings you joy. And make us rejoice and dance. Because heaven rejoices at the repentance and saving faith that you bring. Help us to rejoice in what you rejoice in, Lord. And make that our purpose, to seek and save the lost. Knowing that you work, even through our feeble words. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.